um, to try and stay, f I mean, for me as much as possible, to try and stay focused on strategic value to, to my business and to my customers and my client partners. Um, so not really get, trying to get too sucked up into, into actual delivery of real projects, um, but actually staying really at that kind of, what are the hard questions that customers are asking? What are the what are the big worries that they're thinking about? What are they asking? What does that mean? Um, that then allows me to then think about that deeply, write articles about it, um, and then um, and then come up with answers, um, and then maybe develop a you know a new way forward. Um, so that's kind of where I try to spend most of my time. Um, but you know, hey, that's not, not always possible. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of The Few. And today, uh, we're continuing our journey into the matrix. We are going back into a, a deep dive, a deep dive into the digital world, which um, really is the, uh, that kind of world is the, is the winner when it comes to COVID, uh, if you think about it. Everyone we've had on the show <laughs> either has an online business or some exposure to some digital startup or digital something or other. We'll probably explore what the hell digital means. Uh, it's been a pretty uh, good year for for that world. And uh, today, I think we've probably got one of the best people uh, in the country uh, talking to us about digital. Uh, Sean, I guess what you and I are doing right now is, uh, is a case of digital disruption. I mean, we weren't really consuming content through podcasts uh, five years ago, were we? Absolutely not. And uh, we didn't actually start a podcast until all the COVID stuff happened either. So we actually made a decision to step more into that digital space as well. So it's definitely um, definitely something that uh, has piqued our interest and, and something we're focusing on now for sure. Evolve and embrace anyway. the disruption. Yeah. Uh, and to help us do that and to make sense of it all, uh, we've got uh, Australia's strategic digital mastermind. He is, uh, gosh, who doesn't this man write for? He writes for BRW, AFR, The Australian, uh, Marketing Magazine, cmo.com.au, and he's the... I need to ask him what this actually is. The 225th person to be inducted into the certified, uh, the, the heady heights of the certified experience economy experts. So with no further ado, we're going to introduce today's guest, Mark Cameron. G'day, Mark. Thanks so much for joining Sean and I on the show, mate. Uh, the the show. Few, mate. Hey, guys. Yeah, and thank you very much. Really, really looking forward to the conversation today. Yeah, welcome, awesome. Mark. Thank you, mate. We were just talking about Ricardo before, and clearly the shoey just uh, <laughs> popped right in my head. Uh, mental, mental priming and uh, and association. Uh, Mark, can you can you share with our listeners what the certified experience economy experts are? I mean, it's a mouthful, but but obviously it's a yeah. it's a big deal. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a so um, experience economy has become a kind of a term that's been used like pretty broadly over the last ten years or so. Um, it's really sort of speaking about how uh, people are willing to spend more for fantastic experiences, particularly as they you know, as they sort of um, if they combine you know I suppose products and and you know it's things that create big memories you know or you know have an emotional connection that we're willing to pay more for. Um, there was a guy who wrote a, well, a couple of people who wrote a book um, uh, called The Experience Economy, and I, I, met, I met one of them, uh, Joe Pine, when I was doing some work in the US. Um, and then sort of and then doing some um, some innovation work in New Zealand following that, and um, and he, we just sort of stayed connected. And he said to me one day, "Look, you need to come over to Minneapolis. You need to come do the Experience Economy certification because you know it's it's kind of there's only a few people in the world who do it. Sort of you know people from Lego and from Disney and all these sort of really interesting places. And he said, you'd be, you'd, you'd, yeah, you'd be the, you'd be perfect. So um, sure enough, I went over and, and spent a few days over Minneapolis and, and not in winter, thankfully, because it gets bloody cold there. <laughs> 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 um, but uh, yeah, then yeah, did, did that course. And it was really, it's really sort of understanding kind of the economics behind experience, sort of, you know, why experiences are different. Um, it's understanding how uh, where businesses, when they invest in high level experiences, um, how it impacts their share price and then how to kind of manage that and do that in a way um, at scale. Um, so, so businesses can, can um, you know, actually find a way through that without, you know, lots of like sort of fluffy words. So that's, that's fundamentally what it's about. Um, as, as I said, not many people have, have done it, um, but it's been uh, very, very impactful. 
I think I'm the only person in Australia, to be honest. I think that's ever done it. So when you explain it, it makes sense, and it, it feels like it's one of those things that is kind of a, you know, I guess experience is something like you feel, right? It's a bit like explaining yeah. what love is. It's a feel thing, and to see something that that becomes tangible around that's it's uh, it's really interesting. Well, it's, I mean, you know, a lot of businesses have real world experiences associated with them. I mean, even, you know, even a hospital is an experience, you know, um, or, you know, going to, going to a fun park is an experience, you know. So, and the, the, point, the, the point of this is actually saying some of those experiences are good, some of them are bad, um, but the more you design them and the more you're conscious of what those experiences are for your customers, um, the better you can make them. And if you make them really better, then you make them better, then you create a competitive advantage. And pe- people are willing to pay for that. I remember, I know the uh, the expression, I think it's, you know, I may stuff it up, but here we go. That's something like uh, people don't remember what you do. People don't remember what you say, but they remember how you make them feel. Yeah. And yeah, it, right. it, I mean, it effectively, you know, that experience is the piece that people, take, uh, that, yeah, that people take with them. You know, that's what they actually remember. Yeah, that's exactly right. Mm, mm. Do you think that it's a concept that needs to, pervade everything that we do do you think education needs to be experiential uh, do you think the way that we treat teams and people at work needs to be experiential uh, is there a is there a fine balance because i'd imagine uh, the, the thing about an experience is it's kind of fixed time and place you know if you if you go on a roller coaster and experience at once it's it's great but you do it 20 times you're probably going to throw up right so is there, yeah, yeah how do you yeah. define an experience uh, good question. Um, kind of anything is an experience. Any process, any business process can be an experience if it, if it engages a customer. So, you know, going online, finding a book that you want to buy, clicking, clicking buy, and then, you know, it arriving at your house is an experience. Um, now, you can have a good experience there by the fact that there's not a lot of buttons and you don't have to keep entering your, your details in. Um, and the book arrives really quickly, or you can have a bad experience because, you know, they make you constantly re-log in and put your information in and then find your credit card every single time, and then they tell you it's going to arrive on Monday and it doesn't get there until Friday. You know, that's a bad experience. So, you know, so they think Can you measure that, do you reckon? Is there a, is there a, a scale of experience in terms of... Yep. <laughs> I, I guess it's a review on Google. It's probably a, a great <laughs> indicator of an experience. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and there's... there's a bad one. There's ways of measuring kind of how your customers are feeling about the way your, your business operates and works. And that's one of the common ways of, of measuring that is called net promoter score. Um, and there's a kind of, there's an experience metrics. That and that, is used. that getting embraced? I, I, when I was in the US a few years ago doing some events, uh, it was very big. NPS scores were huge. Yeah. They don't seem to have kind of taken off in Australia. Are you, what's your thoughts on that whole NPS environment? No, look, it's really good. I mean, it can be really, I mean, having some way of measuring kind of what your know, customer friction or customer points is really important. Um, it has been used really, really, really impactfully in some places and in, in some businesses. So and one of the ones I think is one of the highlights, I think, in Australia is um, Medibank. So Medibank uses, you know, uses NPS quite, quite broadly. Um, uh, and they, so there was a, they actually used it in a way where I, I thought it was pretty ingenious where they, um, flipped it around from actually being just a just a lagging metric of how customers are feeling to being a leading metric for of operational risk and financial risk. So, and that what, what that meant was as soon as you start talking about risk, it goes up to the board. The board said, "Yep, we're going to pay attention to this." And all of a sudden, the whole business paid attention to it, and that sort of drove forward a kind of a customer centric view inside the organisation. How important is a customer centric deal? I do, I deal with a lot of smaller businesses, so not your, mm-hmm. your larger corporates and things. How do you, how, how important is that in a small business or, you know, a smaller growing, uh, growing business? Uh, I mean, there was sort of, you know, at risk of being a consultant, you know, just quoting, uh, Robert, uh, quoting uh, Drucker, I'd say that, you know, the only, the only purpose of a business is to create a customer. Yeah. Um, you know, so if you're not creating a customer and you're not keeping a customer happy, then you're not really going to exist, are you? Mm-hmm. So um, I'd say having a really customer-centric view um, is incredibly important. I mean, it, it became very, very, very talked about um, in the early 2000s because customers all of a sudden had a channel for feedback that they never had before in the form mm-hmm. of social media. Um, but, you know, that's... That was that was really a moment that started to drive the idea of, of customer centricity. 
um, now it's really becoming about customer. You know, it could be you know taking that customer, understanding them deeper, and thinking about how you can um, you know evolve your revenue streams around understanding your customer. Absolutely, and I think you've, we've seen that definitely in, in at least in the small business arena that I play in. Um, that people are very quick to uh, to make choices to go elsewhere, and usually the reviews they yes. put are the bad ones and not the good ones. And yeah. uh, so, therefore, the if you don't focus on giving them a good experience, you're going to get hit pretty hard, uh, pretty quickly, and and someone's just going to Google an alternative to you and go somewhere else. Um, yeah. And obviously, that that new landscape, I think, digital landscape, is keeping or forcing people to be to be lifting their game and keeping them honest. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's where NPS is a bit more useful than something like Google, whereas it has like a middle and there's yeah. a, a spectrum, <laughs> whereas Google and Facebook, you're either five or you suck, yeah. um, which is, you know, not fair if, if you think about it. Uh, so, Mark, that experience, was that pre or post digital? Like, uh, hang on, let's go. What the hell is digital? Everyone is saying <laughs> digital, digital, digital. Well, I mean, well, and digital transformation. I, I saw this comic uh, the other day on, on LinkedIn and it had about eight boxes and it goes, right, everyone, uh, we're going to do our digital transformation now. What do we need? And it's just like everyone just blurting out whatever the first thing that comes into their head that's mm. that's digital transformation. Yeah. Um, but but what is it and, and how do you do it? And, and what's the most important thing about it? That's, uh, yeah. Let's start with why. Hey? Let's get. Let's, yeah. Let's do the you know the ubiquitous why. Digital I, I think that's, I mean, that's where you really got us. I mean, quite often, just trying to get a definition of digital inside an organisation is really really hard. Um, you know, we've been in, we've been in engagements. Uh, my team and I have been in engagements where we spent you know a couple of weeks just trying to get an agreed definition of what the term digital actually means for for the different people. But I mean, look, in, in many terms, it's the. Um, I think. I think. To kind of explain what digital transformation is, we need to kind of talk about the difference between digitization and digital transformation. So digitization is basically taking, here are all the processes, here are the things that we do as a business and the way that we interact with our customer, and we're basically just going to put, you know, put a technology wrapper around that. You're not actually changing the way you do business. You're just trying to do things a bit faster um, or, you know, a bit more automated. So when, when you hear terms like SaaS or when you hear about these these huge products that take over the world and they yep. measure how many boxes you've got left and, and and how many boxes before you need to order something new like an SAP or something, is yep. that is that, that, is that is that digitization? Is that taking like fairly manual processes and turning it into a computer or is that? It can be. So it can be. It depends on how it depends on the strategy of the business. If they use if they go and approach a digital transformation with the right lens, which is how do we use technology to change the way that our people and our cust- and our customers interact? Um, and not right, not and it's not just about doing the same stuff that we've always done, but you know it's slightly slightly cheaper. Um, then the and they're willing to look at new revenue streams, look at new ways of doing business. If, then absolutely they can any of those technologies. So you know Salesforce and SAP or any of those kinds of things can can completely change that way that business operates. Um, if the business is doesn't have that kind of level of thought to it, and are just sort of going at it, going, "Hey, we need to cut cost," that's what they're going to achieve. They, you know, they're going to cut cost, and, and well, you know, maybe they will, maybe they won't. Um, but they're not really create. They're not creating a new competitive advantage by doing that. They're just trying to keep up with everybody else. An example of of a business that you've seen that's applied a successful digital strategy, so done digital transformation well. Um, I think they're all ongoing at the moment. Um, yeah, I don't well, think does it's... it ever stop? Is it is digital transformation a start and a finish, or is it is it just what old people call moving into the new world? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's pretty pretty much there. I think. Um, I, look, I mean, I think it, it never really finishes. I mean, I think there's really, you know, this business is doing incredibly, incredibly large business transformations. They're under underpinned by technology. So Telstra is a really good example of that. Um, you know, they're really transforming the way they do business significantly um, and how and what that's going to look like long term. So, they, you know, they come out and say, we're going to move from being a telco to becoming a techco. Um, you know, they're always going to have elements of connectivity and, and tele, you know, telephony kind of at the core. But they're, they're, it's how do they build more value and new value by, by you know, creating technology that sits on top of that. 
I mean, that's a massive change from you know, you know, a business that was all about poles and wires and engineering. And how do they do that? I mean, how do they, you, you look at the, the disruption that has come about in the digital era, you, you look at a, a bank and how much money a bank used to make out of transactions and how, how that's been completely disrupted, Bitcoin, wherever that ends up. How do legacy organizations transform quick enough and, and how do they stay relevant uh, given the, the power of Silicon Valley and the speed at which that, that, that is an ecosystem in itself, is it not, where speed is the essence of what they do, whereas a legacy business doesn't necessarily have that speed. Yeah, there's some interesting points you're raising there. <laughs> um, and I think it's, you know, it's particularly interesting in, Australia, in the Australian context, I think. Um, what are you talking about there is, you know, how fast businesses move, how agile they are, you know, so the agile, you know. Yeah, that's a big term now, and it seems something that people say but don't do yeah. or understand. Yeah, I mean, agile is, you know, there's a methodology and how we do, but fundamentally it's about how do we set our business up to be, to be able to be faster at responding to market shifts than our competitors. That's fundamentally, you know, there's base core, that's really what it's about. Um, and yeah, I think that, I mean, it's, I mean, in these, when a business doesn't have, um, when a business is relatively stable um, and it doesn't have a burning platform, um, the politics and the overriding kind of way that it will operate will be about not really changing the status quo. You know, just really, let's keep things fairly normal um, and we'll be ticking along nicely and, you know, we'll do a little bit of innovation stuff on the, on the edge and, and so on. Um, and that's fundamentally the situation that Australia has been in for quite some time as, a, as an economy. You know, when GFC hit, um, we, you know, we had, uh, you know, we had mining, we had a relationship with China, everything was going pretty well. The rest of the world looked scary. Um, they, they, you know, and then while, you know, there was a lot of innovation coming out of the US, uh, they, you know, we sort of went, oh, look, hey, new competition's emerging, we'll be fast followers. So it's really about, you know, sort of trying to catch up. Um, where we're at now is very fundamentally different. Um, you know, so we so that, you know, the COVID period has really shifted. I mean, people talk about the fact, you know, we've all moved online and we can, you know, working from home and remotely. What's, what's absolutely true though, is there's going to be whole industries that don't look the same now and never will do, look the same. You know, the airline industry needs to completely change. The logistics supply chain is, you know, space needs to completely change. Um, you know, there is, you know, really obvious inequalities in the healthcare system in Australia that you know, it's not hasn't been designed. It's just a function of of geography and, and population density, but technology is a way of addressing those. Um, and you know, those these are kind of the, some of the big issues that need to be start, you know start to be grappled with. Um, and as a result, um, there's going to be new business models and potentially you know the next great you know Australian businesses will come off the back of it. That's no, definitely an interesting uh, space. Observing the you know, the transition. I mean, back in it must be the early mid 2000s um we uh, we ended up getting a force.com um set up business on the force.com platform building you know instances for different companies and but one that was involved in uh, one of the major banks in australia and things like that and you know, i know what you're saying boo was it was it was like pulling teeth trying to get that that gargantuan thing to move um and to get people's buy-in and things like that in the context of um Smaller business, though, what, what I've definitely seen, and I'll get your, obviously your take on this, Mark, too, is um, I feel that the, the smaller businesses have got that ability to be agile, but you've also got now those um, off-the-shelf you know, products, uh, you know, digital products that we can utilise in a small business that are going to make a substantial difference quite quickly. And, mm. and have, you, have you seen that happen in this space you know, in your own experience? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, – I think – you know, there's that's 100% accurate. I mean, I think the the access. So there's a range of technologies that are maturing all at once right now, um, which is also makes the this you know sort of makes the economy really interesting. The access to those technologies, you know, the the barriers to entry is incredibly low. Mm. I mean, even things like AI, you know, like theoretically a business, you know, with a couple of people could be up and running and building AI scripts in a day. Mm. Um, now that's pretty that's pretty amazing in terms of thinking about that technology. Um, and you know, is that, is that the next major piece of disruption in, yeah. in technology? Is is that AI piece? Yeah, yeah, is that, is that going to be as, is that going to be as ubiquitous as the internet? And then everyone can just use that concept to design all sorts of interesting permutations of of uh, of. Oh, and what is it, mate? What what is that? Again, AI. You know, 
artificial intelligence, but it's probably uh, a bit, you could probably explain it sort of more, uh, it's not really intelligence, is it, yet? It, 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 it no, becomes it's learning. Intelligent. It's machine learning, automated decision-making. It's probably a bit, you know, so it's not, well, it's a way of thinking about it. Um, and it's, you know, it's got lots of different areas to it, you know, so things it's like... It's going to take over the world. I think that's what Oh, yeah, it's going to eat everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> the singularity <laughs> event is real. You've heard it here. Yeah. We're all going to be in the Matrix. Isn't We're all going to be batteries. Isn't it Skynet AI. that yeah, it's like Elon Musk yeah. putting up? Is that that Skynet thing from Terminator yeah. he's doing now? <laughs> But it's, I mean, look, we're all, we're all interacting with it on a daily basis all the time anyway. So, you know, you just don't. I mean, the thing about AI I find really interesting is that once, once an once AI application has been achieved and it's scaled, it's no longer called AI. It's just called a thing. You know, it's got a brand on it or it's called Google Maps or it's called, you know, the latest release of Google or it's called Facebook or whatever else it is, yeah? It's like um, saying www. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but everything that people are imagining that we can create in another year that's called ai so ai yeah. is always kind of like that my in my view it's always sort of like it's the next horizon um yeah. most of the time once we've achieved it then it becomes just normal but but i suspect there's there's so much human emotion and context we have to get over when it comes to ai hopping in an airplane that flies itself getting in a driving on the freeway where every car like obviously it'll get there one day but but there's going to be some real human challenges, isn't there? And as opposed to some other technologies like horses going to cars, that kind of made sense. Um, but but when you're outsourcing your thinking, I imagine that plays to a deeper human emotion. Yeah, is it? I mean, I think. I mean, I don't know. It's an interesting interesting question. I reckon. I mean, are we outsourcing our thinking, or are we outsourcing our wasted time? How much of the time? How much of the things that we do on a daily basis, like you know driving a car, could we be doing something more interesting? How much of the time, how much of, the time of, of our day that we're doing, which could be admin or, you know, setting up camera, could we be doing something else? Mm. Um, so I think that's, you know, that's where AI is really starting to sort of play more and more of a role of just, you know, just picking up the pieces and, you know, sort of freeing you up to do more valuable stuff. And that's where you're seeing automation, AI and so on, play a big part inside corporations and businesses right now. Um, where it's actually allowing the people to do what they're really good at, which is be creative, you know, you know, think about new ideas, interact with other people, collaborate, all that kind of stuff, which is actually where the real value is generated, not, you know, not doing repetitive tasks. Where, where do you see the, how do you see the, the, I suppose, the business landscape changing? Hey, let's look at, you know, fast forward 10, 15, maybe 20 years when this, if this stuff is really, really embedded into day-to-day -day activity within most most businesses, what, what do you see the change in, I suppose, culture in uh, in the roles that people will be playing in their in the businesses and the opportunities that could present, and and maybe even like even in the based on what's there now, what what is, what are the things that are just about to go mature and mainstream? Yeah. Uh, so that's yeah. So I think um one of the things that we talk about a lot is the kind of the uh, automated or the you know sort of semi-autonomous kind of enterprise. Um, and I think what's going to happen there is it, it's going to make um, it's going to make businesses a lot more transparent. It kind of because it kind of has to. Okay, so there is a, a type of type of AI called conversational AI, um, and you probably have sort of dealt with that a bit, you know, through things like Amazon Alexa or you know, kind of like Google Home and so on. Um, but there's a whole range of technologies that sit underneath that. Conversational AI is going to um, essentially become our interface layer to all of the data that we've created over the last few decades. So at the moment, all that data is kind of hidden away somewhere and it's very hard to get value out of it. Um, but what uh, conversational AI will do will be allow us to just ask simple questions and then be able to get value. Now, going back to the kind of the, the fully automated uh, enterprise or organization or business. So let's imagine a business like, you know, like a bank, for example. Um, you've got a range of different stakeholders. You've got a you've got a shareholder. You've got a member of the board. You've got a shareholder. You've got a CEO. You've got the CFO. You've got um, you know a manager level, uh, maybe a director level. You've got a you know frontline employee, uh, and then you've got a customer. Every single one of them um, could use the same interface as long as the interface knew who you, who they were to ask this you know the same question. What are the five things I need to think about today when it comes to this business? Um, or, you know, how do I get this little bit of information quickly? Uh, and 
if, if that business would be able to go through all of the information that is contained within that organization and be able to pop back up and say, hey, CEO, here are the four things you need to focus on. Hey, frontline staff, these are the things you need to think about today. Hey, customer, here's how we can help you today. Gosh, good luck with yeah, that with yeah. the average consumer, hey? Wow. <laughs> yeah, I know. There'd be a lot of calls. <laughs> yeah. So, Mark, the few is about you. It's about the people that do what they do. So why do you do this? Where, where did all of this bright spark moment, where did you decide that you'd be a bit of a thought leader and, and own this space? What, uh, what happened? I fell into it a bit. Um, yeah, I mean, along and kind of like um, – you know, most like most people, along the sort of squiggly road to being to where I got to. Um, so I started my career in advertising, um, sort of marketing space in, in New Zealand, um, and then I was there for a couple of years, and then um, well, you yeah, were there for a few few years. Then I went into a um, one of New Zealand's first sort of really big digital agencies, and you know worked on uh, you know worked on a lot of you know, kind of big at that point. This is you know sort of late 90s so it was big websites you know things like you know yeah, what was edit. digital like in the 90s what was the uh it was it was cowboys it was you know just it was anything we wanted it to be pretty much fax machines. <laughs> wasn't it digital fax machines about that <laughs> yeah, yeah it was yeah i mean we're just building big websites and trying to get people to you know like just coming up with you know in different you know interesting ways for people to interact with businesses and you know we were inventing languages. We went and just, you know, people just said, okay, and followed along. It was kind of, you know, kind of interesting. Um, and then uh, sort of by 2000, I was like, okay, I've done quite a lot in, in New Zealand and I really want to head overseas and, you know, sort of explore what's going on. I was planning on coming to Melbourne for a short period of time, maybe a couple of years, and then heading off to New York. But I came over here in April 2001, then September 2001 came along and all of a sudden there was, you know, twin towers falling down and the job I'd lined up in New York sort of ceased to exist. Um, and by that stage I was kind of a freelance sort of gun for hire. Um, and then uh, by about 2003, I joined the company I'm with now, 2007, by 2007 had taken it over, restructured it away from being kind of marketing and comms to being a digital agency. Uh, and then we sort of took it through a few different iterations um, of transformation to being um, where we are now, which is more of a management consultancy in the digital space, so advisors and helping, you know, so helping board members understand things and working with, you know, complex organisations like um, Telstra and, and uh, hospitals and you know, universities and so on, think through their, their digital transformation challenges. Um, and on the pathway there, I started writing a lot about what digital was going to do to our economy and our society, so I started writing that just as a blog. And then I got, got picked up by a couple of uh, magazines, um, and then um, and and then they said, "Hey, could you write write for us?" And then BRW said, "Hey, could you write a write a um, you know write a, a feature article for us?" And then they said, "Hey, that was really good. Could you write a a uh, column?" Um, so that became once a month, then once every two weeks, then once a week, um, and then all of a sudden I was kind of a media commentator. And then um, yeah, now now I write for Forbes, and yeah. Sort of, yeah. How do you balance all of that, uh, Mark? So obviously you balance. do this. What's that? <laughs> yeah, balance. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> AI. Because yeah. um, it's a you know it is a challenge once you start to to become uh, you, you get into the media you start writing. I mean I I owned a publishing business for about three years there, um, and it and I just found the whole thing utterly consuming. It's it's like it there's never an off button. You can write as much as you want, and it will suck it up and use it. Uh, so how do you find that balance between thought leadership, between influencing the market, running your own business, balancing all the other elements in your life? What's your sort of, um, what's your rhythm? What's your trick? Um, to try and stay, I mean, for me, as much as possible, to try and stay focused on strategic value to, to my business and to my customers and my client partners. Um, so not really get, trying to get too sucked up into, into the actual delivery of real projects. Um, but actually staying really at that kind of what are the hard questions that customers are asking? What are the, what are the big worries that they're thinking about? What are they asking? What does that mean? Um, that then allows me to then think about that deeply, write articles about it, um, and, then, um, and then come up with answers um, and then maybe develop a, you know, a new way forward. Um, so that's kind of where I try to spend most of my time. Um, but, you know, hey, that's not always, not always possible. Mm -hmm. 
So on, and then on that journey, obviously, as you said, we all have a bit of a, a snaking road, a bit of winding road to where we are mm-hmm. today. And I'm sure there's still more corners and hairpins and, you know, hairy cliffs on one side and stuff like that. We're going to go past. But um, what, what's, what, how do you process or how do you deal with, you know, setbacks or failure or whatever you call it? How, how do you foresee that and, you know, overcome those situations where you, you are blocked or you have a setback of some kind? Yeah, you must get it wrong in digital a lot if you're at the cutting edge. You must must be quite a lot of mistakes there. Yeah, um, I try and we try and fewer and fewer. Um, yeah, get better at trying to look at patterns and understand what's going on rather than sucked into too much execution. Um, yeah, look, I, I think um, yeah, I mean the the failure bit and sort of you know, I mean look, it, it's interesting within the digital space. It's kind of baked into what we do. You know, like it really is part of the philosophy. I think you were talking about, um, you were talking about, uh, you know, sort of Silicon Valley, you know, that whole idea is, you know, um, start small, you know, sort of fail fast, you know, find something that works and then build on it and then iterate and iterate and iterate and work with customers and collaborate. That's kind of baked into kind of the way that we think in many ways. Um, but, you know, it doesn't mean that you don't sort of make big mistakes and fail along the way and have, you know, sort of big blowouts. And that's that's just a matter of, you um, you know, I, I don't know how, do you, how do you think about it really? It's just a matter of how, how quickly you can sort of bounce back from it. It's just the DNA, um, right? And building up resilience over time. Yeah, I think because you know, I know even from a consumer level, you'll you'll hear like a, a, a Facebook update or a, phone, a firmware update and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, what, what's going on? Why'd they do this? And yeah. it's, but it's instantaneous and it's around the world, like with these, with these big tech um providers uh so i once uh, spoke to um ceo of one of our biggest fmcg uh groups and he and he said to me he goes never trust a consumer to know what they want to consume uh within the digital space there must be an element of that too right because most people 10 years ago didn't know they they wanted a smartphone right they didn't they didn't know that but someone did and someone created these intelligent devices that that uh, I remember having one of the first Palm Pilots. You think of how far that's come. Um, <laughs> how do you gauge what a consumer wants in in the digital world? How do you map, given given how fickle humans are? How do you how do you map and deploy at speed to meet what a consumer what the consumer demand is? Yeah, I think there's. I mean, there's been a bit of a you know legend created about that stuff. Like never. Uh, you know, never trust a consumer or don't ask consumers what they want, you know, tell them what they want type stuff. And, you know, that's what Steve Jobs did. And blah. Look, I think um, in many cases that is, that, you know, I think there's somewhat flawed thinking sometimes. Um, the reason for it is that somebody like Steve Jobs or some, some, there's very few people in the world who can, who can actually see through what's going on and identify an unmet need. Um, and I think it's that unmet need, like really, really being very, very clear at understanding this is this is the problem in the market. You know, Uber got it. You know, Uber's a really good example. You know, the unmet need was actually taxis are dirty. Taxis are not a great experience. Um, I'm sick and tired of having to take my credit card out every time. I hate losing things in it. You know, like the whole taxi experience was was not very nice. Um, and we, if we build a bit of technology wrapper around that and make it more transparent for both you know, for both um, drivers and passengers, then we can help improve that experience. And that's, you know, I think that's that's a good example. Um, and the same thing with, you know, with, with mobile phones. You know, when um, Steve Jobs, you know, sort of came up with their first, you know, iPhone, um, everybody thought he was insane because, you know, it didn't have keys on it. Um, but that's, that's actually what he was realizing was that people were going to spend more time on these devices. They were going to become more powerful and they were going to become one of our primary computing and devices and had, here's how he's going to set that platform up. Um, and I think that's, yeah. So I think, I think there's not, you know, if you don't have that kind of person inside your organization, who can just see into a market and go, here's exactly what's going to go, what's going to happen. Then you do have to spend time, you know, with customers, you know, going through a process of, of inquiry, developing empathy for them and understanding them so you can then start to innovate. Um, and there's, you know, methodologies, you know, we, you know things like design thinking and, um, you know, so human set of design principles that, that have kind of um, have accelerated the way that that works at scale. Mm. Awesome. So one, one other question I'd like to cover is, is slightly different uh, tangent, but uh, um, you know, one of the things we do find in talking with 
people on the podcast here is there's a number of themes. There's a lot of thematics that, that seem to pop out. Um, one of those is about those people that you have around you, the people that you surround yourself with. How important do you feel the people that are, are the closest to you and you've had on your journey, how important have they been to allowing you to move forward and do what it is you do? Yeah, look, I, it's yeah, absolutely vital. Um, I couldn't do any of the things that I do without, without you know, sort of really great people around me, without people who know how where my strength, what my strengths are, what my weaknesses are, and how to enable me to play to my strengths rather than try and improve my weaknesses because that's not going to benefit anybody and it's not going to make me happy, that's for sure. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that's, that's what your partners are for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. I mean, I think um, that that you know those words. Um, every time I hear words similar to that, I might mean, have my dad's kind of voice ringing in my ears. He told me that when I was you know sort of about seventeen or so, when I was sort of, you know, doing his job, and he said, you know, look, you know, whatever you do in life, just make sure you understand, you know, think about what your strengths are, and then surround yourself with people who have strengths and your weaknesses. Um, and I think yeah, it's always you know. The better that works, the better, the better it is for everybody. And does that journey, obviously that changes through a, a life well lived and, and as you ride success, you, you, you probably look for different things and your risk profiles change. So have you found that as you move through, you've, you've sort of adjusted that, that peer group around you and, and, and found uh, at this point in life that you've got the, the, the right balance or have you had the same sort of peer group all the way through from day zero? No, I mean, I've been, you know, I mean, been uh been sort of you know moved around a bit and seen things so yeah definitely different people um but surround me you know, i mean have lots of really interesting conversations with you know so either have you know sort of the direct people i'm working with um and and you know sort of direct sort of partners um and i mean making sure you know that that's obviously you know always going to be very very deep relationships and then then just make sure you have lots and lots and lots of conversations with really really smart people um uh, you know, like I, I, why I particularly like engaging with, um, you know, doing work in the university space because I end up just having great conversations with really smart people who are far smarter than me with, in, in a range of different areas, um, and and just you know understand where to ha- where to develop those relationships um, and where you know make sure that people are going to give you a sort of honest feedback, um, and also look for you know sort of support networks of some sort. Um, as a business leader and a business owner, I mean, that's the most important thing, you know, having external networks where people can sort of say, hey, I know what you're doing, you think it's great, but, you know, actually you're slightly insane, try it in a different way. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That means you're pushing the right way, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. In the right direction. <laughs> Otherwise you go for far too long down the wrong garden path and uh, no one yeah. can tell you. So it's so um, prevalent in, in, in the small business space that people just, put their head down, bum up, and they just go and they go and they push and they push and they don't have that network. They don't have those people around them to, to be a sounding board, to, you know, as Boo would say, to red team, you know, to double check, to just to stress test those ideas and those concepts. And it is such a, you know, incredibly important thing. And, and in your, in your journey as well through, through your career so far, and, you know, what, what would three of the, I suppose the, the biggest, um, biggest learnings that you've taken away that have helped you to progress forward on, on the path that you, you now find yourself on? Um, so when I was saying, I mentioned before about strategic value, like yep. for, for the business, for me, for my customers, like knowing what that is. How does that um, loop work for you? Like a lot of people would hear that and go, yeah, I need strategic value. And then they're going to go, but how do I do that? What, yeah. what is strategic value? How do you ensure that you're doing that? What, what kind of habits and, and thoughts and behaviors do you have that allow you to, to, to continue to create that? Um, so strategic value is really about joining dots, creating new value out of things that don't, you know, you weren't there before. Um, and help, you know, sort of helping bring partners or bring people together that weren't there before. Um, so spending, you know, strategic value is, is, um, if you, you know, if you're actually delivering, you know, the value that the business creates, you're probably not doing it. Um, so, you know, how are you, how are you surrounding yourself with people who are actually doing the day-to-day work or the day, you know, the, the billable stuff or the, you know, the value, the kind of the money generating side of it. So you're sort of freed up to go, what's next? How do we, how do we, how does the business grow? How do we, how do we partner? What's the best, what's the best next step for the, for our business? What's the next best thing for our customer? And how do I take them a new idea? Um, how do I help them see the world in a slightly different way? And that could be tough. Yeah. So, some clients just, they don't see it, right? They're, they're, they're uh, 
there oh, there's this book called proof of heaven and it's about this neurosurgeon that uh, has a effectively his neural cortex has an infection and he spends seven days you know wandering the next life you know take that for what you mean whether it really happened or it was his brain but he talks about this this purgatory where it's like a muck layer and and people just get real comfortable there like they they know that they can move up and there's better better options and better solutions but they're just comfortable with everyone else in the muck how do you do that how do you create influence in particularly in large organizations with their inertia do you do you do you, do you basically just have to find the right organization do you, do you need to find the organization that matches the same mindset as you or can you can you impart your mindset on on, a, on an organization that doesn't have growth mindset i know you can absolutely you can do it on a, on a yeah sort of you know slower and you know um be a bigger organization um it's just understanding what drives them um you know it's really getting down to you know what what's you know what's everybody's KPIs? How are they tied together? What's the strategy of the organisation? Again, you know, trying to understand what everybody's incentives and um, are, and then going, okay, how do I simplify that down to a single story? So you know, with some of our some of our you know sort of larger partners, it's like, okay, well for them it's all going to be about growth. Um, how do we how do we go? How do we think about the ratio of value? So for every dollar they're spending on us, how much value are we creating for them? And if we're able to go back to them and go, hey, look, you know, a year ago, we were, you know, for every dollar you were spending on us, we were creating about, you know, $30 of value. But now we're creating $150 of value. And this is what the trajectory could look like. Then, you know, everybody's on the same page. Yeah. Yeah. And what else? So you got strategic, strategic value. Do you have another, any, uh, any other pillars or kind of uh, just things that you personally fall back on when you're problem solving or, or setting yourself up for success? Um, yeah, so like, I mean, never, never stop learning, you know, <laughs> I think that, you know, it's sort of one of those things that, you know, just always be curious and never try and never, if possible, try, you know, trying to make sure, you know, trying to keep your ego in check and go, Hey, I'm ne no, never going to be the smartest guy in the room and don't try to be, um, you know, there's always going to be somebody who's smarter. So just, just keep learning, just keep, make sure you're learning off every single person and every, every single conversation, every single interaction as much as possible. Um, that's, you know, I think that's always always valid um and always going to be really really useful um so to do that mate just a just a curious one here about in the digital space do you still read books on paper or are you just everything, yeah. everything on a, everything on a screen yeah 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 absolutely i read books on paper books have got a place in the future yeah yeah still gets just occasionally still get the same get magazines that are delivered to someone something other than an ipad yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, cool. So got strategy, got curiosity, never give up, always keep consuming and learning. Yeah. Um, and I think speak the other one is, and this has been, you know, really, um, I suppose, the, particularly over the, you know, over the last few years, is identify the vacuum. Like, so when it, particularly if you're dealing with a, um, a large organization or you're dealing with, you know, in, you know, complex markets and so on understand where that vacuum is. So understand where is it is a vacuum in, in just, you know, decision making? Is it a vacuum in capability? Is there a vacuum in what, what is preventing something moving forward? And then have the courage to just step into that vacuum and go, hey, just tell everybody, hey, this is what we're going to do. Um, because if everybody's feeling that there's, you know, there's something wrong and they can't, aren't able to make a decision or they aren't able to progress forward, what they're actually looking for is somebody to give them permission to do it. Um, so quite often I'd just, Let's just step into that vacuum and just say, "Hey, come on! I'm going this way. Everybody follow." That's a really good point, actually, and that's that's an area around leadership. I think that that can struggle a little bit with this, given that people who are in, in leadership roles can be a long way detached from digital. What the digital world looks like, you know. I've, I, I find it fascinating when you some some companies you go in and you're talking to very senior people in IT and their iPhone is is about six years old with a broken screen and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so with leadership in mind and with this digital juggernaut that's never going to end, what are the keys to success for for leaders to help support that? Because everyone's going to have a great idea. There's going to be lots of options and decision making is much faster in the digital world. So what what are the keys for leaders? to be successful and what are they what's the best thing they can do in terms of enhancing their team and capabilities to to make sure that they keep pace not well, actually not just keep pace but to lift and and embrace digital and, and transform their businesses um best practice is bullshit um that's one <laughs> um you know I, I i think a lot of a, a lot of businesses in australia have gone oh, what is what's happening over the us and we're going to do that 
um, without sort of really going through the process of going, okay, US, very different market. Um, also, you know, they've got, um, you know, 400 million people and we haven't got anything like that. Uh, and so whatever was best practice for US in terms of, you know, implementing technology, this may not scale. Um, the other point is, is uh, quite often best practice and then those kind of ideas around best practice is really just kind of just doing what everybody else is doing. It's not actually saying, okay, what makes our brand and our relationship with our customers different, unique, interesting? And then how do we think about a digital overlay to that? You know, rather than going, okay, we're just going to do the same stuff as everybody else. So, I mean, take, you know, so Nike, you know, it was a really good example, I think. Um, so back in, you know, early 2000s or maybe mid, sort of, you know, 2004, 2005, you know, like they, when they were, they, when they, their digital strategy could have been the same as everybody else's, which is just, you know, let's collect as much data as we possibly can. You know, we'll focus on online ads and we'll do some, we'll do a bit of email marketing and, and you know, everybody will be happy. But they were going, actually, what's our brand about? Our brand is about performance. Can we help our customers? How can we help our customers perform better? And how can we use technology to do that? And so they went through and created, um, you know, what became Nike Plus, which was originally a, you know, a sensor in a shoe that, you know, sort of counted how many steps you're doing and a kind of like a pretty rudimentary online platform. I remember that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it became like, you know, but then it became a wristband. Um, and then it became, uh, and then it became um, uh, an app on your phone, and then it became a suite of apps, and now it's you know like a, now it's on your 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 um, you know your iPhone, your iPhone or your iWatch or it's whatever like else it may be. Platform. What's that? It's like a health and well-being platform now. Yeah, 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 yeah like exactly. A- it's sort of like it's sort of like a whole range of different platforms. Now that I mean, they yes, they've collected all that information, and yes, they know probably within the space of a couple of weeks when. You know how far you've run, you know, you've you've run your shoes, and when they're likely to probably, you know, be need being replaced. So they, you know, they they've got that information. But more importantly, they've helped you perform. They've helped, you know, they've encouraged you. They've find they've tried to find ways to get you to do, you know, to to you know get out and do exercise more and live their brand promise. Um, and you know, it's not a not a uh, you know large stretch from reality to think that in the not too distant future there'll be um you know there'll be the AI driven personal assistant, you know, Nike voice going, Hey, here's your custom designed, you know, fitness program today. Yeah. Um, you know, so, and then you might have a bit more of a personal relationship with, with that brand. Well, that, and that digital technology, I, mean, I use the, the Nike run club app and I've used that for about five or six years now, I think. Mm. And it, it's a great, you know, from a, from an accountability framework, from the fact that you've got friends on there, you can see what they're doing, what you're doing. As you said, you can see how far your shoes have gone. Like it, it really is, and as you say, once you bring in the the AI piece, it's really going to start to be you know, tailored for for exactly that person and what they're looking to do. Get off your ass! Get off yeah. your ass! Yeah. <laughs> they just well, need like, in the watch. Like, to, you got to get <laughs> yeah. up, you know. Or something. Well, so every good. I mean, this is you know one of the things that we advise a lot. But every good tech strategy has what is our platform at the corner at the basis of it, and yeah. a platform isn't about trying to solve every single problem that a customer has, but it's about creating a, a series of enabling technologies that allows your customer and all of their ecosystem to innovate on top of what you do. Mm. Um, and that's kind of what, you know, Nike's platform was actually, well, it's not, we're not actually about selling shoes and selling clothes. We're about performance. Selling shoes and selling clothes is kind of like, you know, a right that we've earned because of that. Um, let's just focus on helping, you know, our customers perform better. Our digital platform will be focused on that performance and how how our customers, you know, interact with that. And as a result, we'll create a real sticky brand, and people will buy more of our stuff. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. So, in your uh, in your uh, journey, and I'm going to uh, use a question that we give to all of our all of our guests uh, or a similar take on it. Um, what's one or you know a couple of pieces of, of, of wisdom and knowledge that you've learnt now in your you know stage of life and career and everything if you were to go back to a younger version of yourself what would it, what would those things be that you would tell yourself what advice would you give buy shares in Nike <laughs> <laughs> yeah, buy, buy shares in Apple yeah, yeah. <laughs> buy shares <laughs> yeah uh, look I think um, um, back yourself you know like always back yourself uh, you know, if you've got a really clear vision um, and you think you've so you've spotted an area of the market that, that can be improved, just back yourself. Just go with it. 
Um, you know, it's quite often you've got to keep going at it and, and allow the market to catch up um, because, you know, um, that's quite often, you know, an innovative mindset spots things before the rest of the world does, and that's a good thing. Mm, um, so, yeah, sort of just back yourself and, you know, wait for, wait for the rest of the world to catch up. It's quite often quite good. Uh, I think we were talking about it before as well. One other thing is, um, you know, when you th- understand who you are, um, focus on the things that you do really well mm. and build on that. Yep. Don't try and keep constantly work on the things that you're not particularly good at because you're just wasting your time. Yeah. Right. You know, you're not trying to be, you know, it's not about being a real, a well-rounded person. It's being about being exceptional in one thing. Mm-hmm. You, know, um, you know, you know, again, taking somebody like, you know, Steve Jobs as an example, he was, he was exceptional at a couple of things mm-hmm. and pretty sure at everything else. Yeah. And that's mm-hmm. fine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, that's awesome, mate. And what, just one more thing I was interested in, Mark, is somewhere in your journey, you went from being an employee to being a leader and self-sustaining. Where was that tipping point? At which at which point in time? Because a lot of people want that journey, right? A lot of yeah, people, people feel yeah. like, no, I've got enough knowledge, I've got enough experience, and I think fear holds most people back. Because by the time you make that decision, you're probably in a nice, you know, middle management job, a couple hundred grand a year. You know, mm. what, what was that tipping point that made you back yourself and and get into being that gun for hire and then building your own business? Um, well, for me, I mean, you know, there was an element of geography because I got in a plane and came to another country. So, you know, <laughs> well, um, you yeah, couldn't was, get a job or, yeah. well, it was just, <laughs> they yeah, crowded it instead. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I think it looked like, uh, it looked like sort of freelancing was, you know, it was, was a, very, a good way to go. Um, but I think, look, I mean, really, you know, sort of taking that, um, you know, sort of making that jump, making that leap, um, is yeah i mean it, again it, it's not going to be easy um and it's not going to it's not going to be you know it is not going to be as safe feeling as um you know it's just sitting in a job and, and helping somebody else get rich um but but if you feel like you have to and you feel like you've got like you know some real value to add to the world and you've got something really really interesting you need to do then you must do that right just, right, you right, know, right, right. That's good, good advice. That's fantastic. Thanks so much, Mark, for coming on to the, the podcast today. I really appreciate it and, uh, and those insights as well. And it's clear that you've got a very, very pragmatic uh, approach to digital. And, and I think a lot of people get overawed by it, but it, is, it just is what it is, right? And it's there to enhance everything that you do. So don't overthink it. It might be the, the best bit of advice for people looking at their, and embarking on their own digital transformation. It's just um, don't think about technology at all. Like, honestly, just don't think about it. Just think about your business model. Think about your people, so your, your customers and your staff. And then the technology piece will sort itself out down the track. But don't start with yep. technology because you're uh, guaranteed to fuck it up. <laughs> Great <laughs> advice. Great closing note there. So, yeah, really, Great really advice. Really appreciate Great it. Advice. And that wraps up another episode of The Few. Thank you to our partners, Afterburner, for team building, development, and alignment. We understand now how important it is to have the right people around you. Get them on board with where you want to go. Momentum Media, the largest industry publisher in the country, connecting your business to the Australian community. ICMI, Australia's premier speaker bureau, representing the few that do fulfill their life's purpose. And finally, Sean's Inner Circle, the business coaching organization for small and medium enterprises looking to make that next step. Thanks again for listening in and downloading today. Please leave a review on whatever platform you are currently listening to this podcast and reach out to our partners who can help you make the transition to the few. Thanks for your time. Let's go on straight on the, uh, on the Facebook post That's right it. there. It. <laughs> <laughs> Don't focus on awesome, Mark. Thanks so much. Really appreciate you coming in. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Mark. Thanks.